The scripture lesson for today comes from Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 11. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And he replied, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them saying, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God today. Thanks be to God. So did you wake up Thursday thinking about that? You're thinking, what? <laughs> it was Thursday. Thursday was Ascension Day, uh, a major feast day in the life uh, of the church. John Wesley, uh, when he sent word, an order of worship uh, for his preachers to America, in addition to the Sunday morning services, he sent guidance for three services that didn't occur on a Sunday. Uh, they were Good Friday, Christmas, and Ascension Day. It was an important day in the life of the church all over the world, festivals and observances. I have a friend, a uh, seminary professor who's traveling uh, in Germany, and he posted pictures. The town where he was shut down on Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, four days feast for Ascension Day. All over the world, an important day, but largely lost on us American Protestants. It was Thursday. You know, we didn't, we didn't think about it. Many of us at all didn't think about it being Ascension Day. At the heart of our confession stands the crucifixion and the resurrection, and a close second clearly would be the birth of the church at Pentecost. And our communal life depends on the certainty of these seminal events. But, but the transformation of those timid disciples uh, cannot be explained apart uh, from the ascension. The, the ascension is a big deal. I mean, it made it into the creeds. Both apostles that we just said a few minutes ago, we said we believe. He ascended into heaven, made it into the Nicene Creed as well. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God. And so it, we say we believe, we say he ascended, but when we say that, what do we say? What, what do we mean? Now if you think about that scene, it's a little wonder the disciples stood looking up into heaven or at the ceiling at a cluster of balloons. It, it was quite a sight. It, it trumped anything they'd ever seen before. There was the, the wow factor of Jesus rising up before them. Uh, the story is reported from the Middle Ages, um, or the medieval times rather, the, the, there's an abbey in Gloucester, England, where two monks, who in the description I read were described as hefty monks, Two hefty monks at just the right moment in the Ascension Day sermon would yank on ropes and a larger than life paper mache Jesus would go from the choir loft up through the bell hole in the ceiling and out of the sanctuary. It was theater. They didn't have balloons. Um, 
but it certainly would wake up a sleeping, sleeping conversation to see a paper mache Jesus go flying by. Did you see that? There had to be a certain wow factor to that day, but, but there was also, I think there was mixed emotion. I mean, they were losing Jesus again. The relief and joy of the resurrection, they thought he was gone and then he was here and now it is threatened again by his absence. So it's little wonder that they are standing there wondering when the men in white say, why are you standing here? What are you looking at? This Jesus that you have seen leave will return and you will not be left alone. Frederick Beekner in Whistling in the Dark gives several images uh, of goodbye that is, that is like this moment with Jesus and the disciples. It is goodbye, but it is not final, and it is not a rejection, and it does not mean that we are alone. He writes, a woman with a scarf over her head hoists her six-year-old up onto the first step of the school bus and says goodbye. A father on the phone with his freshman son who has finished, just finished bawling him out for poor grades at college. There's mostly silence on the other end of the phone and the dad says, well, goodbye. The noise of the traffic almost drowns out the word, but the shape of it lingers on the old man's lips. He tries to look vigorous and resourceful as he holds out his hand to shake the hand of the other old man goodbye they both say it at the same time it makes them smile you know it's been years since the words God be with you disappeared into goodbye but every now and then some trace of them still glimmers through God be with you till we meet again Jesus didn't leave the disciples with a goodbye that was final. It was a goodbye, and God be with you till we meet again. And indeed, God would be with them. Jesus is saying, in the meantime, there are some things for you to do. We're going to talk about those. But, but this was not a final and a forever goodbye. This was not a you are now alone. There was no sense in which this was a, was a rejection and you are not left to your own devices. When we are saying he ascended into heaven, we, we are not saying we're now alone. So what are we saying? Well, well one little side note, if you notice in the scripture, uh, verse 6 it is in chapter 1, the disciples ask, um, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, Jesus makes it clear before he leaves. He doesn't, he doesn't leave a shadow of a doubt. He said, it's not for you to know. You know, I, I take Jesus at his word here. There is no reason for me to spend any time and any energy trying to figure out the end of time and the end times. Because plain and simple, Jesus said, you're never going to get it. You're never going to figure that out. There are some things that no matter what advancements we as human beings make, we will never understand. And it's a good reminder for me that, that there is a God and I am not it. And there are things that I will never understand and that's okay. And I accept those on faith. I trust those into God's hands. There is an acknowledgement of our place. Jesus says, it's not for you to know some things. There are mysteries you will not understand. Before Jesus ascended, he tells them to wait. Wait in Jerusalem. Don't you love to wait? Isn't that, isn't, isn't that one of your favorite things to do? Some people are pointing at each other going, yeah, that's you. Yeah, you love to wait. Uh, yeah, I bet there's some stories we could tell, right? We're, we're always in our, as Americans, we're, we're sort of known as the most time-conscious people in the world. Always in a hurry. The inventors of fast food and instant coffee and instant messenger. I mean, email and Facebook wasn't fast enough. We had to have instant messages. Express mail. Express oil changes. Express ways. We're a people constantly on the move. We're the kind of people that, as a whole, we holler at the microwave because it's not fast enough. The folks at Otis Elevators, 
They've studied impatience when it comes to waiting on the elevators. They, they have it down to a science, the science of waiting. They've been measuring that over the years. And one of their executives said, we figured out that the, the ideal time in, in, in the, is 15 seconds to wait on an elevator. Because at 40 seconds, you can start to feel and see the frustration on the people who are waiting on the elevator. You, you can just see it on the visibly. They are upset because they're having to wait 40 seconds on an elevator. He, he, but when you get in the elevator, the antsiness does not stop, does it? Because what is the button right after the floor button? What's the next button that gets pushed? Close the door, right? If you look at the elevator, the one that has the most worn on the button is the closed door button. Because we don't want to wait on it to close. You know, you think it takes forever. In reality, it takes four, on average, four seconds for the doors to close. But, but we want to do it a little bit faster, which is kind of ironic because in most public buildings, the closed door button has been disconnected. So it's just an exercise for, for anxious people pushing that button. It doesn't do a thing. But we don't like to wait. Doctor's office, long line checkout at the elevator. We, we don't like to wait. Jesus says, wait. Waiting played a big role in the scriptures. If you, if you go back through the Bible, a lot of the heroes of the faith did considerable waiting. Noah waited 100 years plus for rain. Abram waited 99 years for the birth of the promised Isaac. The children of Israel waited 400 years for God to raise up Moses to deliver them. Moses, leading them to freedom, waited 40 years in the desert. Think about 14 years Joseph waited unjustly accused in prison. God had chosen David but he wouldn't uh, ascend to the throne until years later after Saul died. Even Jesus waited for the time of his ministry. Waiting is part of the life of our heroes of Scripture. Jesus said, wait, wait. Before they did anything else, they were to wait. It, it's kind of funny to me. Uh, the book, our lesson was from Acts, right? Which is the short title uh, of the book, which is called The Acts of the Apostles. It is a recording of the activities of the apostles. And the first thing that they are told to do is to wait. Not, not necessarily an activity that we would want to be part of. To wait. Wait. Wait and witness. And they go together and they are sequential. One must come before the other. For it is the power that comes in the waiting that gives us the power to do, uh, to make the witness. No waiting means no witness or at least no effective witness. I suspect that's why there are so many feeble efforts that we, we don't spend enough time waiting. You know, we, we know that waiting is a good thing. We sing about it. We have that favorite verse, Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall rise up on wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. We know that waiting is good, but we still don't like it. Well, school's out, and children are home. Our college students are home. Uh, many of them have come back. Some, some of you remember those days of going to class, or some of you remember those days when you were supposed to go to class, right? Uh, but, you know, that was always one of the questions at school was, how long do you have to, if the professor's late, how long do you have to wait before you can leave, right? Uh, different schools had different rules about how long you had to wait. Uh, at, at one school, uh, the story was told they had a 10-minute rule. Um, if the professor was 10 minutes late, the class was canceled. And so there's, there's one professor showed up. He actually got to class early for the 9 o'clock lecture. He was there early. He left his hat there on his desk, and he went down to the break room, and he got in a conversation with a colleague. And, and lo and behold, he looked down, and it, it was 9.10. And he, by the time he got to the room, it was 9.11. And you know what that meant. Not a soul in the room. They were gone. So the next day they showed up and he gave them what for. He lectured them. He said, if my hat is here, I am here. So the next morning he came in at 9 o'clock to give his lecture. You know what he found? 28 hats. 
Not a student in the place. Despite what the professor said, the hat is not enough. Just waiting is not enough. What you do while you wait is critical. Are we invested? Are we engaged? Are we praying? Are we studying? Are we worshiping? Are we with the community of believers? What are we doing in the waiting? If you've ever spent any time in an ICU waiting room, then you've had an experience of waiting community. If you have a friend or a loved one, a family member in ICU, and you're there for several days, uh, then you know the, the kind of community that happens there. You, you can't help but, but learn the stories of the people waiting around you, and you learn the characters in their family, and, and you know, who are the in-laws and who are the outlaws, and, and you begin, you just, it's just part of being there, and, and you start rejoicing when they get good news, and, and then when they get news that's not good, you start to console these people who before that time were total strangers and waiting together builds community. If you've ever been there, you, you know what I'm talking about. Well, being together is important. How we are together and wait together. And that's one of the reasons we do other things besides just worship and, and mission at the church. So worship and outreach are, are really our two big things that we do. But one of the reasons we do other things is so that we can be together. It's probably not the best day to talk about being together um, given given that there are people not here, but, but it's true. It's, it's part of what we do so that when we have a meal, part of it's to be fed, but also part of it is just to spend time together because when we wait together, intentional community can grow. We do things like Grace's planned joint summer Sunday school, and it's an example of, of how we can be intentional about waiting together. We can study together, but we spend time together, and we have to do that. We can't just send our hat because we'll never have the community. We'll never have the strength. We'll, we'll never have the power if we just send our hat. Th those first disciples, they... They must have shared with one another their anxieties and their fears and their hopes and their dreams as they walked back to Jerusalem that day. Jesus had gathered them to be a community and taught them as a community, and he left them as a community. The Spirit would come upon them as a community. Now, no doubt there, were, there are individuals encounter, encounters with the Spirit, but... But the church, Jesus formed an intentional community to spread the good news in the world and, and to bring about the reign of God. And that hasn't changed. Two millennia later, it still takes a community of faith, spirit-filled, to spread the good news and to bring in the reign of God. That, that's our challenge, to be the body of Christ as followers of the way. When we say he ascended, what we are saying is we need to wait and we need to be intentional about the way we wait. The other thing we say, I think, is that we are saying we've been welcomed into heaven, into the very presence of God. This is the ascension is an affirmation of humanity. You know, a lot of people struggle with self-image and self-esteem and and, and to me, this is an affirmation of who we are as human beings, that, that Jesus, fully divine but fully human, ascended and took his place in heaven. In some ways, I think every day we ought to, we ought to say Genesis 126 out loud to ourselves. Uh, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. We need to be reminded that we have value. That we are made in the image of God and that this God who made us, who became one of us, has now taken our nature even closer, even into the very heart of God. And we ought to realize by that act how fearfully and wonderfully we are made. The ascension is an affirmation of humanity. 
We've been drawn by our Redeemer right in to the very heart of God. Luke, the physician, is showing us a picture of humanity, the humanity of Jesus taken into the heart of God, and it opens the door for all of us. As the world changes, we we confront all kinds of new insecurity. We experience oppression and violence. We, We confront suffering and death. We long for healing and wholeness. We work for justice. But through it all, we carry this vision of our real that we matter to God. The human one, Jesus, who made himself at home with us, has been taken up to God And the scripture says he will return in the same way and restore the world. So what are we saying? We're saying when we say he ascended, we say we should wait. We're saying that we've been welcomed into God. And ultimately we're saying that we're called to be witnesses. Waiting precedes witnessing, but but witnessing still. It's one of the two things Jesus said to do. He said, wait, witness. The power of the Spirit comes to enable us to witness. At the ascension, the body of Christ was taken out of the world. But next week, we'll celebrate Pentecost and the birth of the church. And what do we call the church? There we go. The body of Christ. The body left, but the body is still here and we are to be about that work we are intended to fulfill the role of Christ's body to be the incarnation of his love in the world today so that the world our community beginning right outside our doors that they know that Christ is still alive that Christ is still establishing and growing the kingdom on earth Some of you are no doubt classical music and opera fans. Uh, The composer Puccini, who wrote La Boheme and Madame Butterfly, in 1922, um, he was beginning, he had begun another uh, another opera, but he also had been diagnosed uh, with what they called cancer. Uh, And he was working night and day to work on the score over and over. And his students, his friends, his family, they said, you need to save your energy. You you need to get well. But when he got worse, he he kept working. He he called his disciples, his students together and said, "If if I don't finish, if I don't finish the opera, I want you to finish it. Well, he died in 1924, leaving it unfinished. His disciples, his students, they gathered, they studied what was written, and they finished the opera. It it was 1926 in Milan that it was debuted, and Toscanini, his favorite student, was chosen from among the students to to direct this, this masterwork. So they went through the piece. They got all the way down to the place that Puccini stopped, and 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 the orchestra came to a stop he put director put down the baton and turned around and said to the audience this is as far as the master wrote and then he died and there was silence and then he picked up the baton and he said but his disciples finished the work And the opera ended to thunderous applause and took its place among the greats of classic literature, music. So it was that Jesus stood outside the city and said, here's the baton. Finish the work. Finish the piece. He, He left. And he left the work for his disciples to finish. That's what we say when we say he ascended into heaven. We acknowledge that we're to wait, intentionally wait together, worship together, study together, pray together. We we are saying that the gates of heaven have been opened to the human race because one of our own has gone before us. We're saying that we will be witnesses 
that we will finish the work. For the reign of God will not happen because of some apocalypse from the outside. It will happen because the students, the disciples, continue and finish the work. May God add his blessing on our life as those disciples called to live, called to be faithful, to live as disciples of an ascended Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.